Good evening, everybody. I'm Peter Pritchard, president of the Freedom Forum and president of the museum. I want to welcome you all to Museum New York. Uh, we're very glad to see you here for what we hope will be an interesting and stimulating program. I want to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this program. Uh, a few months ago, uh, Harry Evans uh, showed me some proofs of his book and some of these remarkable pictures that he and Gail Buckland gathered for it. And I said, uh, well, perhaps we could do a little exhibit at the museum on this uh, wonderful book. And little did I know that it would turn into a huge packed room and uh, an A-list group and uh, network news coverage uh, uh, on several networks. But that's what happens when you get involved with Harry. A very small suggestion can turn into a very big idea. And we're glad to be here tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about the Freedom Forum, which uh, funds Museum New York. The Freedom Forum was originally the Gannett Newspaper Foundation. It was founded in 1935 with a small grant from Frank Gannett of $100,000 in Gannett stock. That has grown to about a billion dollars in assets and shows you the value of compound interest, if nothing else. <laughs> we are an independent, nonpartisan, non-political foundation. In the early 1990s, uh, when Al Newarth retired from the Gannett Company, he reinvented the, the uh, Gannett Foundation as the Freedom Forum, and we are now the largest foundation in the world working exclusively around the world to improve journalism and support a free press. We have uh, operating centers here in New York, our Media Studies Center upstairs, we have a First Amendment Center in Nashville, a Pacific Coast Center in San Francisco, and international operations in London, Johannesburg, Hong Kong, and Buenos Aires. Uh, and our main goal is to support free press, free speech, and free spirit. And free spirit is whatever we say it is, and I think you'll see a lot of it here tonight. I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, two people. Uh, first, the uh, founder of the Freedom Forum and the founder of USA Today, a well-known columnist and a great Yankee fan, Al Newharth. <laughs> and our chairman and chief executive officer is here, Charles Overby. And we have uh, two trustees, Betty Bow Lord, the best-selling author, and Dr. Bernard Brody, an eminent physician from Rochester, New York. Finally, I would like to introduce the woman who put all of this together, Tracy Quinn, the vice president for Museum New York. Where's Tracy? Right back there. And Bob Giles, our uh, Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the Media Studies Center. And there's Bob. <laughs> now it's my pleasure to introduce Harry Evans, a person who started in journalism as a reporter for a weekly in England at the age of 16. He then went on to become editor of the Northern Echo, one of the great names of journalism. And then he was editor of the Sunday Times in London for 14 years, during which time they did many famous investigations, including the uh, stories that talked about the dangers of thalidomide. They broke that story. He then be was editor of the Times of London, and he wrote an excellent book about his tenure there called Good Times, Bad Times. Harry then moved to the United States, where he has been, in chronological order, editor-in-chief of the Atlantic Monthly Press Publishing House, founding editor-in-chief of Condé Nast Traveler, president and publisher of Random House Trade Group, and now he is editorial director and vice chairman of U.S. News and World Report, the New York Daily News, and Atlantic Monthly, and Fast Company. He has had more careers than any three people, and now he's the author of the best-selling illustrated book, The American Century. Harry, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I must say, it's wonderful to see you all. It reminds me when I first came here in 1956, and it was a, a mob like you that got off the boat with me. <laughs> uh, you've done very well. Congratulations. Uh, that was 1956. I came back here frequently and fell in love with the country and then got exasperated by some of the contradictions of it. And that was the origin of the book. And I begin in 1889 because that's when the second... 100 years of the American century begins at a time when America is beginning to look outwards. And it's extraordinary when you think about the changes that have occurred in that period. I mean, in 1889, only 26% of the population could vote. And 77% of that 26% did vote. 
Today almost everybody can vote, but it's only half the population that bothers to go and vote. So that's one of the things we may touch on, the threats to American democracy. The uh, nature of the country is transformed from being a country where you, if you were a man you could expect to live only to be 41. Of course for a woman it was many years older. For some reason I've never been able to understand. And today it's uh, 71 and 78. The life expectancy has been transformed. But what's happened to democracy? We began with the, with the country apparently in peril from, according to the British visitors of those days, H.G. Uh, Wells and I was very pessimistic about Rudyard Kipling that the country was going to break up into ethnic tribes and couldn't survive. And as you know, Teddy Roosevelt said it could be done. It was possible to take this heterogeneous crowd and turn it into a viable democracy. So, no more from me. Let's begin by introducing this distinguished panel. I must say I'm very honored that they're all here tonight. Anita Allen, Professor of Law. The biographies are on your chair. Governor Cuomo three times governor. He'd have been in the White House if he'd run in 1988, but I never reasoned why he didn't. <laughs> William Buckley was the St. Paul of the conservative movement. <laughs> <laughs> Founder of the National Review. Um, Lanny Guinea. I must say about Lanny Guinea, I'd never met her before tonight. But the picture of her painted in the press, Mr. Pritchard, in 1993, when she was demonized after being rejected by President Clinton, is quite, uh, quite an extraordinary piece of press distortion. Lanny Guinea, the title of her book, by the way, is not The Tyranny of Justice, but The Tyranny of the Majority. Uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, a critic reviewing my book favorably said, he mentions Arthur Schlesinger a lot. <laughs> Well, it's true. I couldn't avoid it. I kept trying, trying to find ways to cut him out. <laughs> but he kept surfacing. Even at the end, I had to quote from the disunited states. And Robert Hughes, the only foreigner in the group, <laughs> <laughs> since I'm now an American citizen, I think I can say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just <laughs> but he's an Australian citizen. I'm going to begin, actually. I think I'll start with the foreigner by asking him, the American century, it's a piece of impertinence in a way to call a century belonging to one country. But Americans have always thought of themselves as being exceptional right from the very beginning. In fact, let me give you one quote. Let me get one quote of the opposition benches here. Woodrow Wilson speaking at Sioux Falls in 1919 on that tragic tour of his before he collapses and comes home said this, sometimes people call me an idealist. Well, that is the way I know. I am an American. America is the only idealistic country in the world. Bob Hughes, how exceptional is America? Uh, very. Um, historically uh, and um, also at present. But you see, I think what's interesting to talk about is not the... Um, What is interesting to talk about is the roots of this conception that Americans have of themselves as being a special case among nations. I mean, this is much stronger in America than it is in any other country that I've ever lived in. And it, you know, it was hardwired, I think, into uh, American thought processes right at the beginning. Not by the Spaniards, who were the first to colonize America, because they were, after all, just making a replica of old Spain as best they could in, a new, in another country, but rather by the English refugees, the Puritans, uh, who came here in the 17th century. The Puritan enterprise was, in a quite literal sense, to invert history, to cause a transcendence of history by setting up a, uh, a truly moral and virtuous state um, in a, uh, an essentially unexplored world. And from this there flowed the idea that um, uh, People living in America, I mean, the first person to call himself an American was, I believe, calling him, was a Puritan calling himself that in 1660 or thereabouts. D be more precise. <laughs> <laughs> um, from this there flowed the idea that um, uh, 
there was a double mission. There was a, there was a mission into the wilderness, a mission of internal colonization, which gave rise eventually to the rather debased idea of, uh, um, uh, what was it called? The, the uh, uh, um, um, manifest, destiny. manifest destiny. Manifest destiny. And secondly, there was the idea that America should be literally a light unto the world and a, you know, a kind of shining example to all other nations. Now, uh, of course, being an Australian, it's difficult for me to share these views because we began as a jail and therefore had nowhere to go but up. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, uh, this idea uh, of a, uh, an America constantly in a state of self-transcendence and exceptional in that regard among all other nations is not only the source of so much American energy, but also, of course, the source of so much American disappointment. And, the, the, um, and it intersects with a thing that we don't normally associate with Puritanism, which is the cult, the worship, the desire for newness. Um, above all, this country was to be new, it was to be a new example among nations, and uh, the myth of constant renovation and newness is something which is, again, hardwired, it seems to me, into the American psyche in the same way that reverence for antiquity was hardwired into the European, and it fulfills much the same kind of primary social binding symbolic functions. Mm -hmm. well, so it is an exceptional... It, it, it conceives itself exceptionally. It conceives itself in an exceptional way to be exceptional. Right. Governor, what do you, how do you pick up on that? I, you I, have a small card. He lost me at the first turn, I think, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know you've often tried to sum up what is the essential American the, character. Well, well is, is, are you asking me the same question? Do we think of ourselves as uh, exceptional? Yes. I don't know who the they is. You have um, about 260 million people in the country at the moment. Um, maybe 40 or 50 million are poor. And all they're thinking about is why they should be poor in the richest nation in world history. Mm -hmm. 160 million are workers. 80% of them are low and moderate skilled. And the chances are they haven't gone anywhere in 20 years. And they're trying to figure out why everybody is boasting until recently of a tremendously powerful and successful economy when in order to stay up with the cost of uh, health care and college education and transportation and housing, they need to work an extra job or um, <coughs> longer hours. 20% are high skilled. They're doing very well. The entrepreneur class, the business class, which is doing better than anybody, large business particularly, and people like myself who are in professions that earn a good deal more money than they're entitled to, um, we're, we're, doing, we're doing exceptionally well. <coughs> and so you have 5% of the people over $100,000. That's the largest percentage of Americans ever to earn that kind of money. More millionaires and billionaires than ever. Now then, who is it that thinks of us as exceptional? The business class that is spending a tremendous amount of time investing its money in other parts of the world because the labor is cheaper, you know, they're not trying too hard to you know, make us the, the strongest place in world history. I don't know who the they is, maybe academicians, maybe people like that, but the real Americans, a vast majority of them, are still in the struggle of their lives, as far as they can tell. Now, to go back to Kevin Phillips's Politics of Rich and Poor, uh, a book that uh, had two blurbs on it, I remember. One, I think, was Richard Nixon, and the other was mine. <laughs> and, uh, and I said about Kevin Phillips's book in 1990, I think, this book should have been written by a Democrat. What Kevin Phillips said was that the workers in this country have gone nowhere since, I think he, he used 1977. And that is a fact. And so, so there, is a, there is a myth at work that we are tremendously successful in this country. We're not. To me, the disappointment of the American century is that for all the grandness of this miracle of a place, and nobody knows the miracle better than I do because of the way that my family has benefited personally, but for all of the miracle of its achievement, the tragedy is that with all this power and strength, we have done so little to rid ourselves of some of the fundamental problems. Yeah, we still have a health care problem, 41 million people without health care insurance right. who are workers. Right. 
Uh, we still have a poverty problem that is unjustifiable given our tremendous power. Mm -hmm. We have the most violent people in the world, the most imprisoned people in the world. Now, this, I'm talking about the greatest nation in the right. world. Right. I'm, I'm not diminishing our stature. I'm saying that power and that stature requires that we perform better than we're performing. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know who it is that um, would call us exceptional now. Bill? <laughs> uh, the, you know, the, the, the trouble with Governor Cuomo is that he's off on one of his tobacco road speeches. <laughs> uh, and, uh, he, this is no, what happens. Nobody does it better than he does. Bill, this is what happens when you get hit by lightning. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it, it, uh, I agree with him that a, a lot of people struggle. And w what did he name? He, they struggle for education, for transportation, for health. Well, if they struggle, that means that the people who are educating are getting more money, right? And the people who are transporting are getting more money. Otherwise, why are you struggling, right? Uh, so the people who, who give you health care are getting more money. Now, uh, if you look at the statistics, um, they, they don't wipe away poverty, but they tell you something very simple. By current uh, standards of poverty, 90% of the American people were poor in the year 1900. That 90% has diminished to between 13 and 11%. There is an oscillation. Now, what the interesting question is, why has it stalled at that particular point? The, it is kind of comforting to find out that the average poor person spends twice as much as he allegedly has. But the, the, the question that we need to, need to go into is not, uh, is it exceptional that America has poor in it, but is it exceptional that we graduated so many people at such an enormous rate from poverty into relative affluence? Mm -hmm. but, the gap be stop. but the gap between the rich and the poor is wider in the United States than in any Western society, is it not? You're going to challenge me on a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and he spent did, did 12 you, did, years. <laughs> <laughs> the gap between the rich and the poor is wider than in <coughs> any Western society. How would you cope well, with that? Well, you know, that's... I know, it's a specious statistic, no, no, right? yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's an endearing cliché. <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely uninteresting because... It doesn't really matter how many people are rich. The question is, is there an ascendancy among the poor? The answer is there is right now. In the last a couple of years, there has been, there was a lot, uh, a certain amount in the 80s. The graph is not uh, as sharp as it was in the preceding four, three or four decades, but it's going up there. How, who cares how many people are rich? I don't care. I, mean, uh, um, I hope you become rich from your book. <laughs> we're, we're all cooperating, That's aren't we? Too close, too close. <laughs> Lenny, do, Arthur, do, Lenny, do you want to kill? Yes, I, I, Arthur. Harry is absolutely right. The gap between the rich and poor in this country, the disparities of wealth and income are increasing. They're greater in this country than they are in the so-called class-ridden societies of Western Europe. And it's a great shame. It's not a question of the how many people are rich and so on. It's the question of the real disparity of income, which uh, increases and... But on the larger question... You were instructed of, to interrupt. Why does the disparity matter? Because this... Why does it, uh, does it matter if one person is a trillionaire? What, what, who cares? Because you have very few people who have a great deal of power and a great m large yeah, number of people who have very okay, little. You're changing the subject. You're talking about uh, power. Well, uh, power, power, wealth, uh, power and money are closely yeah. related, Bill. Particularly you may not notice it. <laughs> <laughs> On the larger uh, question let, of... You show me a really power powerful poor man or a really powerless rich man. <laughs> All right. Oh. Very good okay. point. Good point. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, On the larger uh, Arthur, question Arthur. of American exceptionalism, I do think that the myth of uh, American exceptionalism is a treacherous and de dangerous myth. Mm -hmm. The notion, because it's dangerous, because it leads to the sense of self-righteousness, which leads us to believe that we are, as Wilson said, the only idealistic nation in the world, and therefore we have a right to uh, intervene and fiddle and tamper with the affairs of, uh, meddle with the affairs of other countries. William James, the great, um, greatest American philosopher, once said, Angelic impulses and predatory lusts divide the soul of America as they do of every other nation. <laughs> and that is true. I mean, we're the notion that, that we are uh, unstained by 
original sin, where, where, and we are exempt from the... Uh, Hamilton rejected this whole view in the, in, the, in the Federalist Papers. I do think that the one argument that could be made for American exceptionalism is the fact that we have written down certain ideals and standards in a constitution. The constitution which we have notably failed to live up to in, in many respects, but at least it sets out ideals, it sets out the means by which we can approach those ideals, and in, in that regard I do think we deserve a modest share. But, but the notion that, I, that generically we are somehow morally superior to every other country is nonsense. Uh, uh, Arthur, you would agree though that it has been an extremely powerful myth that... Oh Hamilton yes, it's a, it's a dangerous myth. myth. A dangerous myth, Lanny. Do you want to come back on Mr. Buckley? I suspect uh, no. you do. <laughs> I don't want to come back on him. <laughs> yeah, Anita, Anita, sorry. Uh, I, j just somewhat responding. I, I, you asked the question, well, who cares about the great disparities of wealth and income? Well, one reason to care about it for all of us is that if you care about democracy, you care about people being able to feel as if they're part of a common community. And I think that the, uh, the, the very, very rich and the very, very poor have a hard time, in some very literal sense, occupying the same world. And that, that does, I think, undermine uh, democracy. But the other thing I want to say about this American exceptionalism business is that uh, while uh, I agree with Governor Cuomo that the very poor are so busy worrying about uh, uh, money and, and, and making it, I also think, though, that even very ordinary Americans can feel exceptional and feel prouder and better than people in other countries because of the richness of our popular culture. We have, they think, we think the best music, the best dances, the best food, the best sports. And those kinds of things, I think, feed into this, this sense that we give the world that we are uh, quite exceptional. Now, yes. it may be un untrue. It may be our, our naivete, our lack of travel to other countries that makes us feel exceptional for these kinds well, of things. Well, and on the cultural yes, level, yes. benign and generous, yes. too. Uh, the, the, uh, there's no question that American popular culture has had, although we can get to this later, has had an enormous effect upon culture throughout the world. And not all of it swamping it in a kind of ghastly Disney-esque way, but actually inspiring it and giving it can, can character I, and uh, meaning. Uh, can, can I try to, to uh, restate my position, lest it get confused? By all means. I, I, I believe... St. <laughs> <coughs> Paul used to be my favorite saint. <laughs> There is, there is no question we are literally exceptional. There is no question we are the most powerful economy in the world. Right. There is no question we have the single remaining mega military force, and therefore we are superior there. There is no question we're the greatest engine of opportunity in world history. The ten generations at least of people like my own family came here who didn't have a chance in the place where they were and succeeded here. There is no doubt about this. There is no doubt that we're the richest. There is no doubt that we have the single best idea of government, which has succeeded uh, miraculously well for 200 years, the rule of law. All of this is true, and all of this I accept, and all of this I repeat, I'm a better witness to than a lot of other people because I was so lucky here. <clears throat> but I don't think we're anywhere near where we should be and could be in terms of what we do for our people. I think that you can be the greatest nation the world has ever seen, which we are, and still fall tremendously short of what you ought to be doing with your gifts and with your strengths. I see no explanation for why we should be the most drug-addicted, the most imprisoned, the most violent, with the largest number of handguns in the world, with an average wage for families of somewhere around thirty-eight or thirty-nine thousand dollars, with a wage for individuals of somewhere around twenty-four or twenty-five thousand dollars. Well, the thing which is, I just stop you is: Are we in this litany seeing? the penalties of freedom, is it a contradiction of capitalism that you get these things? And I think perhaps you'd come in on that. Well, part of what I think is happening and part of the reason that we may be talking past each other is that we're not articulating what we mean by rich, what we mean by successful. And there's a hidden assumption 
behind what a lot of people mean when they say we're the richest nation or the most successful is that we generate the most amount of money and that the way in which you measure success is purely on how much money do we produce, how much money does somebody earn, that then tells us how successful they are. And I see that as a real um, danger to this quote-unquote American century, and I certainly hope we can rethink the way in which we've put money at the pinnacle of our hierarchy, in which we, ha we, we essentially have created a religion around money. Who does that? Who does that? Yeah. I mean, who, do you know anybody who does I don't. <laughs> you do that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do it. I think that's what, um, if you say what's happened to our government, well, it's been taken over by money. If you say what's happened to our popular culture, it's been taken over by money. I think that there is a real danger that many of the important values that um, Mr. Hughes alluded to are being cannibalized by this enormous appetite for more money. And I was reading the New York Times recently, and they were describing to someone who knows nothing about Wall Street what's happening on Wall Street, and they said, well, we don't know whether it will be fear or greed that will um, um, dominate. dominate, exactly. And my view is, I don't want to live in a society in which those are the only choices. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Bill? I, I think uh, we, ought to, <laughs> right. we, ought, we ought to record that uh, we, we happen not to be the richest per capita country in the world. Um, right. uh, Switzerland's richer. Right. Sweden. Uh, the, Sweden is richer. Uh, Denmark uh, is richer. Richard, right. uh, the, 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 the miracle here, if you want to use that big word, mm -hmm. is the rate with which we welcome people and lift them from uh, the condition that Mario, Co Mario Como has described uh, to a improved position. Something that doesn't go on in, in Switzerland or, or in Denmark at anything like that, uh, uh, that velocity. But, but to ask the question, is, are we inclined to crime because we are free? Uh, That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't think it follows, but it, it does follow that we are free to commit crime. Right. And it, it does follow that we're free to buy. Uh, no, to uh, take, take, take the guns, which the governor mentioned, uh, is part of alleged constitution. If you read the article carefully, it doesn't say it. But that's what I'm trying to get at. Is, is, is it possible to have the degree of freedom economically? Well, you, you and, can, and yeah, you can ask that question in a, in a very specific way. Let's, let's take some of the, uh, the gaps in, in our pattern of success. You have 41 million people who are not poor enough to be on Medicaid, not old enough to be on Medicare, not lucky enough to have a boss who includes them in a plan, and not able to afford insurance. 41 million working people who can't get health insurance. This means this woman who's working at $30,000 a year with two children, if she has a breast cancer, she's finished. She's bankrupt. She'll get health care. But she's bankrupted. And so last year, we had a larger number of personal bankruptcies than ever before in history, mm -hmm. a condition which a lot of the members in the Congress are trying to cure by making it impossible for those poor people to take bankruptcies. But anyway, so, so then the question becomes, <laughs> the question becomes, uh, is that a necessary price you pay for a so-called free enterprise right. system. Exactly. Would you have to convert this government into communism or socialism in order to deal with that problem? And uh -huh. I, say that's, I say that's an absurdity in, in a government like this one, which can afford a uh, hundred billion dollars over seven years for a capital gains tax cut at the same time that Alan Greenspan says our problem is exuberance in the stock market. Right. You know, you have to wonder yeah. whether they couldn't have found some of that money to deal with 41 million people who can't get health insurance Double. by, by right. subsidizing private plans. So, right. so I say we could do a lot better than we're doing. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Let, let, me, let, me make you, let me make you feel better, Governor, by simply saying the overwhelming majority of the 41 million who don't have health insurance are people who elect not to take it. Oh. Are they the people who elect bankruptcy? <laughs> the, the yeah. Many people do. We have, we have we, in fact, we have... Stick up. Okay. I, I, I um, urge you to look... Let, 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 I urge the skeptics to look at the... How do you feel about the suicide? <laughs> Listen, Mr. Exactly Dutton, this, this is a free country. Speak. By Professor Tom Sowell. 
Yes. Who observes that the average 21 year old doesn't care about health insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's so hard to understand. Uh, I didn't have health insurance when I was 21. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, could uh, I come back here because. Health, you, health, health insurance is something that makes, says other people pay for it. Right. Uh, come uh, back then, Lenny. Okay. Because I think that part of the problem, and when I said we revere money, I perhaps didn't go far enough. <laughs> because I think that what may be appropriate within the market, that is the notion of self-interest, and I borrow a lot of these ideas from a book I've just started reading, The Crisis of Global Capitalism by a capitalist, George Soros. George Soros. Right. Okay, and part of what he's teaching me is that in the marketplace, self-interest is a, an appropriate guiding force. But that is not the same force that should be regulating democracy. That democracy is a system for making collective decisions where you have to sometimes make decisions that are not in your personal self-interest. And what we are lacking is a way for getting to collective self-government um, that is not just about aggregating individual self-interests in a way that allows those who have the most money to determine everyone else's collective uh, interest. And that's where I would also take a respectful issue with Governor Cuomo. I don't think we have the best idea of government because I think that we have an ideal of democracy, but I think we could actually learn a lot from going to Australia, going to other countries, and observing the way democracy is practiced. We have people who actually believe in the political process, actually participate, and actually... Yes, there are well, other forms of democracy. No, yeah. no the... Uh, 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 under, the uh, under the general umbrella of the idea of rule by vote of right. people. And the, the um, I mean, it seems incredible to me still, after all this time in America, that you have this uh, chaotic and loaded uh, system of health care, for instance, in which, you know, basically um, good health care is not accessible to the poor or to the, you know, it is the, the, the people get bankrupt in order to die in comfort. And, uh, you know, this is not a country in which to grow old or a country in which to be sick. You're voting for the governor. Hmm? You're voting for the governor. Mm. Oh, I'd vote for the governor on that any time. <laughs> but, um... If that's true, why didn't you do something about it? You were governor for a long time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it. That's the AMA. No, 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 hold it, hold it. Now, I, I thank you for that question. <laughs> I thank you. Now, uh, first of all, the Child Health Plus program that was passed by the federal government last year came from New York State. We invented it. We also spent millions of dollars on distressed hospitals all across the state, especially in the metropolitan area, because the federal government wouldn't save them, and so we did. We, uh, we start, started Child Health Plus by taking children who were 14 years of age. We eventually got up to 18 years of age, subsidizing their plans, private sector plans, with uh, taxpayers' dollars. Uh, we, uh, our our knife firm plan was the best in the country, uh, described that way by George Bush, our health care system. So we did everything we could do as a state. Incidentally, remembering I had to balance the budget while President Reagan was thrusting us into billions, uh, trillions of dollars of debt, so, uh, okay. which made it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> I'm come back to the idea. Can I get back to the idea yes, of yes. government, Lanny? Right. Uh, I, I say I believe that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution together are the single best idea of government in the world. Now, I also say that we haven't applied it and used it as well as we should. We haven't certainly in healthcare done, uh, done it as well as we should. We haven't in, an, uh, in a lot of places. And there is no real argument between a free enterprise system and democracy, or a capitalist system and democracy. We have never ha had a purely capitalist system, and we've ne never had a pure democracy. We have always had government interventions from the very beginning. The question is, which interventions? Mm -hmm. For example, the bankruptcy law itself is a government intervention to save big business, mostly. It is a variation on the free enterprise system. The bailout of the savings and loan, the Resolution Trust Corporation, that wasn't free enterprise. That was a bailout of the people who went down, the depositors and others. So we have plenty of interventions that 
the rich forces in this country and the powerful forces in the, do not argue about. We have a social security system that takes care of you whether you're rich or not. We have a Medicare system that takes care of you whether you're rich or not. That's not capitalism. That's social intervention mm -hmm. in a democratic system. <coughs> but we're very discreet <coughs> about the way we use this power. We will not use it for the 41 million. Mm -hmm. Now, who I just discovered don't really need it because they're just <laughs> cavalier. You yes. Arthur, 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 Arthur. I would say that the love of money is not a novelty of the 20th century. When Tocqueville came to the United States a century and a half ago, he said the love of money is the ruling passion of the Americans. And that's not, un not unnatural. I imagine it's a modest passion for most people in this room. Since money is... is what a, about sex? It's a passport to <laughs> decent living. But I think the interesting thing is I do not believe that democracy can exist without capitalism. That is, you have to have private property, you have to have something which is beyond the uh, direct access of the state in order to have political opposition, intellectual freedom. C democracy requires capitalism. Capitalism does not require democracy. You can have a capitalist system as you do in Singapore or in China or in Spain, Franco-Spain or in Russia. You can have, you can have capitalism without democracy. But I, the reason why uh, democracy has, uh, why capitalism has survived is precisely for the reason that Mario Cuomo was mentioning, and that is because of the intervention of the state. If, if capitalism had been in its 19th century form, when Marx predicted it would perish of its own contradictions because of what, uh, the increasing gap between rich and poor, class conflict, and so on, well, what saved capitalism from the Marxist, dread Marxist fate was the intervention of the state which humanized the industrial order, introduced uh, limited, you know, wages and hours legislation, social security, unemployment compensation, to some degree, medical provision for medical care. It's all those things that have saved capitalism from the, from the Marxist calamity. It's what FDR did was really to rescue capitalism from the capitalists. Mm -hmm. Not a, and that's, that's, the, in, that's the constant, the, the, the love of money has to be put in some form mm -hmm. of social discipline it, and it, social context. So it's context of social responsibility. And that's the constant <laughs> struggle which keeps between democracy and capitalism, which keeps capitalism what alive. What happens when what, the market what, takes over the democracy? Well then, you, what, the great virtue of democracy is its capacity for self-correction. Uh, Anita? Well, it's, it's very comforting to say that um, capitalism is modified, that democracy is um, alive and well. Um, but, but there is a, a problem with our democracy right now, and, and you talk about it in your book, and that, that's that very, very few people are participating in governance on the local level, the state level, the federal level. People aren't voting. People vote thoughtlessly. Uh, right. I, I mean, I hate to criticize myself and my fellow. We do vote thoughtlessly. Many of us pull the, the lever for the whole party and not think about which candidates actually would do a right. good job and so forth. And, and, so, and so I think we have a reason to worry as we're facing the millennium about whether or not, in some sense, democracy is, a, is a falling away as a, as a real functional value. Mm -hmm. you know, freedom, liberty, those ideas seem to be alive and well and really flourishing. But I wonder if we really have a, a, a sustainable democracy anymore. I mean, I, I, it just, it just, it's so little involvement in government, so little concern about the, the, the details and the rigors of government. Why do you think it is that uh, Americans have so massively shied away from voting? We're, we're too secure in our freedoms. We, we, really, we really don't believe that there's any reason to be concerned that things will go terribly, terribly badly. And it may, take something like, it may take something like another depression to remind us that we have lots of good reasons to worry about, about uh, the, the, the basic shape that we're in. About the I basic think Americans state of the, don't of the vote because they're not stupid. And ah, uh, wait a minute, what's, wait a the linkage, what's the linkage between the two? Wait they're not stupid and so therefore the, they see that their vote isn't going to count? Right. Do you believe that American votes individually don't count or that people feel they don't count? I think unfortunately both. And that's because you have the problem of candidates essentially marketing themselves to voters 
without political parties mobilizing or educating the voters about issues. And the candidates use polling techniques to determine what it is the voters want to okay. hear them say, and then they are able to frame their message in a way that appears to appeal to what the voters think they want. And so you have this entire manipulation going on. Yeah, this is a problem for some editors, but too. Let's, uh, 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 I would like just like, I want to uh, focus this. This is a very interesting stage we've reached. We're really discussing threats to democracy. You are identifying money and the fact that it's been corrupted. It's corrupted the system, correct? Arthur. Well, I would say that the, the, the decline in uh, voter participation seems to me very much related to the decline of the political party, as, as you, Lani was saying. In 1888, we eight, nearly 80 percent of the eligible voters voted. Right. In 1988, barely 50 percent voted. Well, the difference wasn't that the candidates were more magnetic or the issues more compelling in 1888. Uh, the difference was that the party was uh, mobilized voters. Right. And with the decay of the party, uh, the party has now been replaced like by television. television. Right. You're television about the is, the yes. Party political managers have been replaced by, by con political consultants who are mercenaries who work for one work for one party or another, and as a result of that, the kind of participation which I can remember when I was young, where they had they had parades, they had rallies, where, and so on. No more of that. So yep. they're volunteers. Mm -hmm. People are now who participate in political campa campaigns are all paid. And, some, and this is, I think, one very important factor in the decline of participation. Yes, you're talking about, among other things, the decay of what used to be called the party machinery. Yeah, absolutely. The, the um, you know, people would go along at all levels through the neighborhood block by block and they'd say, hey, you want this? Get out for candidate so-and-so. But I, w and I would add one other thing, which is, at least at the congressional level, the reason people don't vote is because the election has already taken place. You think that you're going to vote in November, but... but um, P.S. The incumbents have drawn their districts in a way that they've already determined what the outcome is, except in a very, very few districts. I um, read a statistic that more incumbents die in office than lose when they run for re-election. Yeah, right. So the election has already taken place, and then you invite the voters in to participate in an empty ritual. They That's do have this uh, uh, despairing attitude to the process of voting. And no, are you for no. once? I, I think that the... Uh, the failure to vote is an aspect of the sophistication of the voter who little by little is beginning to understand that government can't bring on what it wants. It wants uh, happiness, <coughs> wants good care, it wants security, it wants economic ascendancy. And it doesn't much matter uh, within a range um, who wins that particular uh, election you don't think so? in terms of translating what it is that they want. The sophistication of the American voter has to do with the recognition that 95% of what that voter wants can be accomplished only by him or her. So what kind of ocracy is this you're talking about? It's a kind of... <laughs> it's, it's not democracy. What is it? I mean, this is a kind of a... Monocracy. monocracy. No, no, they always said right. they, they're at liberty to vote. The, uh, the vote is primarily a negative instrument. It, get the rascals out. It's extremely important for that reason. It doesn't much matter. This vote uh, this November is going to be pretty important. Uh, Bill, no, no, this, uh, this, uh, 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 my, my um, experience is a little bit different, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> my experience. Well, he would say you're a rascal. My, my experience is that the richest and most powerful people in this country vote at the highest incidence, and they vote almost always for incumbents who they want to keep in place because they do business with them. Especially and they're not, let, let me, let me, no, no, everybody with money and power does the same thing. There was a quote in the New York Times yesterday, I think it was Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, and someone else, and they all said the same thing. We give money to whatever incumbent agrees with us, even if he's a libertarian. They don't care. If you're going to vote, if Al D'Amato is going to vote with Merrill Lynch, then Al D'Amato is there. That's what they said. They said, if you're an incumbent, we give you... I know that, Bill. I couldn't get two cents running against Ed Koch. Uh, I, I had no money. He had a lot of money. I won. I just barely beat Lou Lerman, who was very rich. They started sending money in through the... Uh, transom. The, the transom. To me. I met people on the street who gave me money. They handed me... <laughs>
handed me, this is the, I'm not exaggerating. A guy gave me an envelope. Fortunately, I had a state policeman with me. And, and I, I said, what is this? It was a check for $25,000. Wow. I said, did wow, you, yeah. I said, I cannot take this check from you. I said, but did you give it to me in the campaign? Was it illegal? He said, you weren't governor in the campaign. <laughs> So, so now, so, 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 the, so your, your theory about the sophisticates, the, sophist the people who know best are the ones who vote. The ones who do not vote are the poor people, those struggling middle class people who, number one, are probably too busy because they're working overtime to stay in one place and who have given up on the system. They know it doesn't respond to them. They know that, especially so you're at this moment. About special interest voting, and no, I don't no, have that for they, one minute. No, they don't think it's relevant to them. They don't the, believe that the people in Washington mm -hmm. are going to do what they need. Now, this, this is very serious. This well, but again, serious. you have to look at the, the a profile of the American people. 160 million working people. 80% of 160 million are low and moderate skill. That means they didn't get four years after high school. They're working like mad to stay in place. 47 to 50 million poor people. We have more poor people than 1987. Now, you take that population. They're the ones that voted for me, frankly. And I lost in 1994. That means they're a number. They voted at 40%, while the people who voted for the conservative Republican voted at 80%. Mm -hmm. That's why Henry Hyde and the Republicans can look at these polls that are 60-40 against impeachment and say, we're confident with our position, because they'll get 80% of that 40%, that's 32%. So, so what, You'll get 50% of 60%, that's 30%. They beat you 32-30. Okay, okay, so, so, okay. So, uh, 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 does, this, does this mean, does, I'm going to get Bob in a minute, don't you have compulsory voting in Australia? Yes, we do. Ah, that's democracy. Now, you see, um, it seems to me that that actually is democracy. I wanted to jump in with that, you know, the, the, uh, uh, because, it is, in Australia, a misdemeanor. Uh, I mean, it's not a high crime. <laughs> but, um, but, um, it, is, it is certainly a misdemeanor not to, be, uh, not to vote in, in, a, you know, in a general election, and, 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 and I think one can be fined $15 for not doing so. Um, now, the, the, there is a more important principle here than I think than many Americans realize, because, in fact, you don't get a plebiscite unless the whole plebs gets in and votes. What you get is a cross-section of people who for one reason or another wanted to vote or who can be reached by television commercials or this, that or the other. But if voting is optional, then immediately it lends power to the, uh, I think, staggeringly uh, corrupt and politically divisive system that uh, the, 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 the whole matter of appealing to the public by paid advertisements on television opens the board to. I believe that one of the things that has really screwed up American politics actually, without intending to of course, was the advent of television because it just made the whole business of reaching a, um, uh, the electorate absent any kind of agreement with the, um, with the channels that there should be free time given to uh, uh, intended representatives. Absent that, it just makes the whole business of reaching the electorate so cripplingly expensive. In, yeah, that it, in England, of course, you can't do that. I'm not saying England's superior. No, you can't, you know. because thank God you have the BBC. But, uh, the, <laughs> no, but you can't do it anyway. Yeah. Well, when can't you do say it that, pardon? what do you mean? I, I would say that the most fateful decision uh, free people can make is to decide who should govern them. This is only in the United States, in Taiwan, and in one other country, which I have forgotten. Does this decision, does this process provide a means of private enrichment? Every other country, every other Western democracy, provides free time to political parties during campaign. 75 cents of every political dollar or more goes for television. If we were to follow the example of every other country to provide free time to political parties during elections, it would much reduce the role so of private money. So what stops it? President Clinton, when he was, had the broadcasting bill, did suggest this, that he would ask for free time for all the political parties in return for passing the broadcasting bill 1997-98, which greatly enriched the broadcasting corporations. Did you approve of that or...? N no. I think it's a... <laughs> I thought <laughs> not. It's, 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 it's an appealing uh, I idea, but then one, I think, asks oneself, what is it that one sees in political advertising? Uh, most of it is disreputable. 
the idea of having more by Senator Pothole than we now have on television is, isn't, it seems to be an engaging uh, form of idealism. But what about the fact that, um, at least in terms of the broadcast networks, that's a public resource. These are licensees of the public government. Of the public, you are, these are making, trustees. You're making a procedural point. And that's I, not I, a I, procedural I, point. That's a substantive point. They don't own the airwaves. Those no. are our airwaves. They are borrowing them for I'm, nothing. I'm not worried about that. And they should owe us. I give it to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I take it. I, I, I think we they can hold their li They hold their license under the terms of the Federal Communications Act in terms of the public convenience, convenience interest, and necessity. Yeah, I know. And the part of that should be certainly to provide the mm -hmm. public education during a political campaign. And uh, not in the I think form of should... more negative ads. What but I'm in trying terms to say, Arthur, is, um, is that there, there is no reason based on what we have seen to suppose that there would be significant stimulation of public knowledge if we had more of it. Uh, I I, 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 I've spent a few years in Mexico where they had compulsory voting dating back to, uh, to the revolution, to, the, uh, uh, to, to 1928, and uh, they had uh, the uh, directed democracy, they called it. Uh, the yeah. same party always won, but everybody had to vote. Uh, uh, so well, I, 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 I think... He's talking about the public airways being right. uh, not but used for the she's public... She's asking a procedural point. She said, if yeah. we want it, can we have it? I say, yes, you, we <laughs> can. The, the question is, do we really want it in the sense that we are expecting something is realizable? No. I don't think so. It's not realizable um, because... Sorry? Bill, can I ask you a question? Do you think that the transmission of uh, ascertainable popular will through elected representatives is clarified or obscured or helped or hindered by the enormously time-consuming and energy-consuming process of political fundraising? Do you or do you so not answer the question I now? Think a, I think it's a terrible bane, and uh, what I dislike most about it is the number of people who, for, for that reason alone, don't compete for public office. One of the problems yes. in the United States is it's extremely hazardous to enter public life, is it not? You spend half your time raising the money, another time being exposed. Well, the other exposed. half for sodomy. Yes. Well, something. speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and let me ask you, let, so threats to American democracy, money we've identified. Television. <coughs> television. What about uh, the nature of the population, the fact that we now have a great new immigrant population, which may or may not share the values. Is there any danger of a disunited states to take a book, the title of a book that Arthur wrote? In a country, is this a racially divided society, and is it likely to get more racially divided as we go into the 21st century? Don't all speak at once. Well, the answer is yes. It is racially divided. I was in Georgia last week, and uh, uh, somebody I was talking with uh, was running for governor of, of Georgia. There's never been a Republican governor of Georgia. And uh, I said, well, is the black vote something that you can appeal to? He said, well, the black vote goes 95% Democratic. If I can reduce that to 94%, I can definitely win. Really? Now, that certainly suggests a division, doesn't it? Right. It, it has nothing to do with whether there's a merit to it. You know, the Jewish uh, uh, um, vote is pretty concentrated, 70, 80%, 85% uh, Democratic. So, so the answer is, uh, obviously there is a division. Whether that division uh, is rooted in meaningful alternatives or simply is a legacy is the question, I think, to ask. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new about uh, ethnic blocks, voting blocks, and so on. This has been true since the beginning of the Republic. Indeed, politics has been a great means of harmonizing the, the traditional New York State balance ticket get an Italian, an Irishman, a Wasp, and a Jew on the ticket. That's, these were part of the process of assimilation and the culturation, which has kept America together. Do you think assimilation is continuing? This is yes, I, I tell you, I think, with, in spite of the fact, we, we're, let's face it, we've been a racist nation from the beginning. We're a nation that began by killing red people, enslaving black people, importing brown and yellow people for peon labor, and so on. And it's, it's, it's racism it was in our statutes, it was in our condition reflexes and so on. But the, the, one of the th abiding themes of American history has been the process from the, the movement from exclusion to inclusion. That is going on. 
Bernard Mirdo once said, the difference between the minorities of Europe and the minorities of the United States is that minorities of, of the United States want to join the mainstream. Minorities in Europe want to withdraw from the mm -hmm. mainstream. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, an essential thing. The real problem with the United States is, is not that uh, the minorities wish to secede. It's the, the, the white majority keeps slamming doors in their faces and burning crosses on their lawns. But it's been argued that uh, minority preference actually encourages people to remain separate and not join the melting pot because once you've lost your minority preference status and gone in the melting pot, you've lost something valuable for education, for ed college and employment. You know, the famous cases, this is the affirmative action area. What do you say about that? Well, I want to come back to something that Governor Cuomo said because I would like to approach the issue just a little bit differently. He said we imprison the most number of people of any I don't know if you would include all countries, but certainly any democracy. Yeah. And I think race is one of the reasons that the statistic he cited is true. If you look, for example, in California, for every five black men who are in prison, you have one in college. Or look at it the other way. For every one Hispanic who is in college, you have three in prison. And part of what's happening in the United States is we see prison as a reasonable alternative for integration. So we educate some... How, how do you mean? You're pulling our leg. Wait a minute. Wait I a am minute. perfectly serious. I am perfectly serious. And, let, and I'll tell you a story. I'll make it short. Edward Lutbach, a foreign policy analyst, went to Japan and went into a Japanese gas station. Four young men rushed his car. This was several years ago and pumped the gas, gave him lots of service. He realized he was paying for this service through the inflated price of gas because the, ga the Japanese government had made a choice. You cannot compete based on price, only based on service. And they had made that choice because they wanted to ease the transition from high school to work for a segment of the society that was not going to college. Japanese corporations would not hire anyone who was under 24 years of age with no work experience. Look back then, comes back to the United States, drives into an American gas station, no service. Right? He has to pump his gas, um, check his own uh, tires. Price of gas is much cheaper, but the same four young men, if not literally, figuratively, are hanging out at the gas station. The difference is, in the United States, these are black or brown young men. They are not considered, quote, <coughs> one of us. And what he said is, although he's not paying directly for their service, in fact, they're providing him no service, he's paying indirectly through the taxes he has to pay for the criminal justice system, for the welfare system, for his car insurance, for an alarm system. And if he's really unlucky, he pays in his own blood. And part of what's happening in this country is we see that as a perfectly appropriate distribution of resources mm -hmm. because we see them, those four young men at the gas station, as not part of us. And therefore, if they end up going to prison, well, that's their destiny. Anita, do you have a comment on that? I was uh, in Germany recently, and I was reminded that there, uh, you can be uh, born in Germany, your parents could be born in Germany, your grandparents could be born in Germany, but if you uh, are, have Turkish ancestry and not German ancestry, you cannot become a citizen. I do think it's important that in our, our country at least we don't have this sort of uh, grotesquely exclusionistic sense of what it means to be a citizen. We do, however, have the legacy of slavery and uh, Indian wars and uh, etc. Um, I, I think it's ridiculous to think that, um, that African Americans or other minority groups want to be separate in some, uh, in some uh, uh, deep and profound sense and not tied solely to wanting to enjoy their own families and their own cultural traditions. Uh, I think African Americans would like to be a part of society, but the kinds of economic factors we've been talking about all day, Governor Cuomo and, and, and especially emphasizing those, and the kind of, um, of low expectations that the society has for African American men especially. It's okay to be in jail. Jail is an alternative to other kinds of social uh, control, other kinds of social encouragement. We, we have this tremendous problem. Um, I, I am, uh, you said you were in Georgia. I, I'm going to Georgia this week. I was in Georgia recently. My family's from Georgia. Um, not Tobacco Road, but something similar to that. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and in 1975, my parents, middle class African Americans, bought a, a, a little ranch house in a, in a mixed neighborhood and enjoyed integration for about two years before the white people left. Right. Uh, I, <laughs> there's a lot of, of, of same kind preference in our country that we haven't 
really been able to, to get rid of. And it's not a preference based uh, always on hate, but it sometimes is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, and, and it is, I think, a threat to our democracy that right. we don't have more comfort with each other. Right. We, we flee from the same schools, the same neighborhoods, right. the same workplaces. Mm -hmm. the, um, it, when when, when you, you f reflect upon the fact that <clears throat> from the very beginning <clears throat> we were made up of um, strains from all over the planet, um, and diversity was an essential part of our beginning, it is an essential part of the sustaining of the country now. The birth rate is going down. Uh, thank God for immigration. And uh, you're constantly replenishing the strength, especially of a place like New York City, with people from Pakistan, from Africa, and from all over the planet. That is not, and, and that kind of stark difference always brings with it a certain amount of alienation. Right. When the differences are in color or culture, etc., there's always going to be a little bit of resistance and a little bit of discomfort. That's mm -hmm. always been the case. I don't think it's the essential problem. The racism that the black has faced is an essential problem. The anti-Semitism that the Jew has faced and still faces, but uh, that we don't talk about as much because as a group, they appear to be more powerful in our society. But that anti-Semitism is still a very strong strain in this country. Th those, are, those are problems, but they're more moral problems. I think there's one essential difficulty with the country now. And this, this uh, I, I, it's, it sounds almost simplistic, I think. But the Constitution never anticipated and never provided for a community that related one to the other. The Constitution from the very beginning um, concentrated on freedom, mm -hmm. liberty, opportunity, responsibility, rule of law, the opportunity to go as far as you could on your merits, and all of that is absolutely virtuous. It never said you should be a community. It never said what the whole Judeo-Christian Tradition teaches, mm -hmm. which is if you're a Jew, tzedakah, you're all brothers and sisters, and what do you do with it? Tikkun olam, your mission together, all of you, the black ones, the Italian ones, the poor ones, the rich ones, all together you're supposed to tikkun olam, repair the universe. The Christians borrowed it whole. Mm -hmm. What's the rule? Love one another as you love yourself for the love of me and I am truth. What is truth? You're supposed to work together to finish creation. We don't believe that as a people. Mm -hmm. We don't believe, there's nothing in the Constitution that says, and if Roosevelt hadn't interpolated it right. in, the Depression would never have ended. Mm -hmm. Even though you needed a Second World War to complete the right. job, right. there was nothing that said, when you lose your hand in a machine and you can no longer work and there is no one in the village to care for you, mm -hmm. the collectivity should get together and take its wealth and say, pay for this person's family's food. Nothing said that. But there was no such requirement. We had to invent it. We're still in the process of inventing it, and now we're in a stage after President Reagan, we're a little bit embarrassed by it. Now, the code word for it is government, and now government is bad. What you're really saying is, look, tikkun olam is for Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah. Loving one another is for Sundays. <laughs> Caritas is for putting money in the basket. Don't bother me civically. <laughs> but, 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 you, but, you, but, but you don't need a constitution to... Go on, go on. Uh, Buckley. Uh, uh, St. Paul, I should I, say. Go on. I, I think that the, um, Dr. Gunier's uh, um, analysis of, of prison as an integrating instrument... Uh, uh, oh, it's a disintegrating. It, it, a disintegrating. It's, 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 it's really a terrible dodge. Uh, about a year ago, I went to a, 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 prison? a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a Jewish sociologist from NYU, sort of a family group, said, you know, I, I did a little research uh, recently. And if, if you subtracted the black population from America, the crime rate would be somewhere between Monaco and Liechtenstein. I thought, well, that's, that's an extraordinary discovery. Now, this has nothing to do with what provokes black crime, right. but it has a lot to do with the plain, dumb fact that the incidence of it is five or six hundred percent uh, greater than the incidence uh, uh, among uh, non-blacks. Now, talk about what to do about it, but in the course of doing it, uh, uh, don't, one shouldn't be too delicate to analyze the fact that it is an overwhelming black problem. Well, Professor now, Randall, sorry? Uh, go. I know that um, Buckley doesn't like facts, but 
the idea, for example, if you look at federal prison, you have 60 or 70 percent of the prisoners in federal um, prison for nonviolent drug crimes are black, and yet the use of drugs by um, African Americans is not 60 or 70 percent of those using drugs. So part of this is an enforcement problem, and it's an enforcement problem that focuses on those who are so poor that they have to engage in their drug abuse in public as opposed to those who can afford to do it in private. Mm -hmm. So we respect criminals as long as they can um, disobey the law in the privacy of their own home. But beyond that, I think that part of what we have to look at, I've used the metaphor of the miner's canary, that when the miners used to take a canary into the mines, to alert them when the atmosphere in the mines was too toxic for the miners to stay. My view is that the experience of many African Americans, many Latinos, many um, disabled Americans, many um, women, is the experience of the canary. And they are alerting us to a problem in the way in which, in my view, in this particular case, we have tried to criminalize many issues that belong in the public health arena. They belong um, in other areas of our community. and I thought your um, use of faith-based and spiritual values, Governor, was um, really eloquent. And we, instead of trying to deal with those issues as a community, we have simply said, well, we'll have the criminal justice system deal with them. And since so many African Americans are poor, we are essentially hurting many African Americans through the criminal justice system. That's why I say that we, as a society on some level, are making a decision that we are going to educate some kids in kindergarten and send them to college, and we're going to take another population from kindergarten and send them to prison. And we use all kinds of techniques to sort, mm -hmm. but the outcome is predictable, and that's the problem. If you can look at an African-American kid at the age of four or five, you can unfortunately predict their outcome. And to me, that's a violation of democracy and equality. And a denial of the American dream, and right. I, Bill, I have a question for you. Right. I, th we're, we're roughly from the same period. Right. I remember the old movies. I still watch them on AMC. I love the channel. But all the old prison movies were the same. It was Jimmy Cagney on his way to the chair. <laughs> it was George Raft who played an Italian. There was one Polish guy and a black guy with a banjo playing <laughs> Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. <laughs> With that was the prison population. And that was the movie. The Irish guy, the Italian guy, the Polish guy, and one black guy. <laughs> what have we done over the years to make it dominantly black now? Now, the truth was that in that period, the population in the prisons was white. A lot of Italians, a lot of Poles, a lot of Irish, and a few blacks. What's happened, do you think? Let me tell you? Yeah. It's on the breakdown of the family. The, the rate among black well, then, teenagers no, 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 was about... Go, go no further. About then tell me what made the families break down. I'll tell you that. Okay. Okay. The, the, uh, the black crime rate among adolescents, late adolescents, which is the worst part, people between 15 and 20, mm -hmm. 25, was about 10 to 12 uh, percent 50 years ago. Now, this, this is a remarkable rise in crime rate. What, what corollaries can we reasonably come up with that might have had something to do with it? The answer is the huge preponderance of single-family parents. 83% of those born in Bronx last year were to a single parent. This is not something that would have been true 50 years ago. So I invite you at least to speculate on that corollary, even if you don't... Well, I, I tell you, the, the, it, it, it's interesting, but then that, that means you'd have to study the situation. Jimmy Cagney, who had a mother and a father in that movie, George Raft, who had a mother and a father in that movie, and the Polish guy, who had two mothers <laughs> and one father. <laughs> so, so, and, 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 then, and then also you have to ask yourself... In the 30s, you, they didn't yeah, have blacks as You have to ask yourself where these, the where these young women who are having children come from. Now, if you go to all, my old neighborhood in South Jamaica, you'll find a lot of them, not so much today as you would have 10 years ago, but, it, and, and why? Well, that's a project neighborhood. What's a project neighborhood? That's a neighborhood where you built these high rises, you took a lot of poor people, you jammed them into a small space. 
in numbers much too dense for that community because you wanted to keep them away from the rich people and the middle class people. So you built high rises, you piled them on top of one another. There weren't enough jobs, there wasn't enough room, there weren't enough schools, there weren't enough hospitals. Are they handled you, in Japan? You, you, well, no, no. See, this wasn't true of Cagney, Raft, and the Polish guy. But it <laughs> was true with the black population that we raised. We created a special kind of environment for them that was bound to fail. It was so bad we had to blow up buildings, Pruitt Igo, in the middle of the United States of America. We had to destroy a building because we knew we were creating an underclass of course, by jamming them into a space too small to breathe in. And then you empty a child out into this community when it's two years old, surrounded by pimps, prostitutes, debasement of every kind, grows up to be 13 or 14, there's no hope here, the school doesn't work, all the guys are in jail, there's no point in doing anything. I'll have a baby. Why? Because it's something I can love and something that loves me back. And then you say to them, okay, well, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, you're right, you shouldn't have done it. What would you have done if you were in her position? See, so this is a situation that we created mm -hmm. over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years. I'm not saying you're wrong or I'm wrong, but we are wrong. Mm -hmm. We created this syndrome. We're wrong for giving black civil rights. No, we're, no we're wrong yeah. for jamming them into space that w anybody with any common sense would have known cannot possibly work. Mm -hmm. When you put them into these tall buildings where there were no jobs, there weren't enough seats in you the make school. make it sound as though we stuffed them in there. We did indeed <laughs> stuff them in there. Absolutely. That's exactly what we did. Why did they what, come here? Uh, why did, uh, uh, why, uh, why uh, did uh, we... Uh, uh, why did they come here? Yeah, uh, because you dragged them here in chains. That's why they came here. Look, that, that's, a very, that's, a very, that's a very important point here, which is, uh, which, is, which, which is the millions of people, the millions of blacks escaping from the South, coming up without any education, coming from a terrorized society and escaping. So the South United States surely, I would suggest, has a great deal to do with, with what happened in this situation by holding blacks down for a long time, not educating them. Then they, with civil rights, they come up to the north. There's no work, no work. There's no skill, no education. And they're stuffed into these buildings. See, if I, if, see if I'll tell you. The yeah, South is easy. to be blamed. Yes. Because, That's what I'm just suggesting. Because so many blacks left the South to go north? No, because they were held down for so long in slavery. And, you know, and gradually they, they fled when they got the opportunity to flee. But that time they came north without any education. They came up here as kind of semi-slave labor. You're talking about before your book began? No, I'm talking about after it began. I'm talking about the great You're exodus, about slavery, which right? Nicholas Lehman has demonstrated in his book, The Millions Who Came North, and came north to what they thought was going to be prosper. Nicholas Lehman wrote a wonderful book. Can we talk about, about the good news? Yeah. This morning in the Wall Street Journal, first front page, the rate of pregnancy among unmarried black women is down. Yes, it good is. Good news, right? Yeah. Good. Well, thanks for the news. Look, this is... <laughs> we've had a very, actually, a kind of disturbing portrait of the American century. And I want to ask you, I mean, really, we know we've got a lot of problems. I want to just ask you, each of you individually, what is the single great achievement of the last hundred years in this country? The single... And what, one, one each. You're allowed one each. And you can disagree with Mr. Buckley, if you like. <laughs> yes, you. Start, you. I think the single greatest achievement, despite all that has been said about race, I think the single greatest achievement of the last hundred years in America has been the amelioration of racial prejudice, the gradual, though still imperfect, rise in the social opportunities and the social status and the income and everything else that black Americans can hold. I mean, there is... Uh, the, this, this is actually unparalleled uh, in other societies which have suffered from a high degree of endemic prejudice against minority mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. Anybody looking forward from, eight, you know, from the time of Reconstruction who had been told that there were going to be dozens of black mayors and high-level black politicians and, and scores of high-level black politicians and Mm -hmm. so on throughout this republic would have been una unable to believe it. I mean, for all its imperfections, I think it is a great social triumph. Arthur? I think the move. I agree with Bob Hughes. I think the movement from, as I was saying earlier, from exclusion to inclusion right. has been an abiding theme in America, intermittent, belated, and so on. But it, still, the progress has been in that direction. 
I wrote a book called The Disuniting of America, but I think the most telling statistics are the, uh, the, the statistics of intermarriage across ethnic lines, across religious lines, increasingly across racial lines. So my belief ultimately is that sex and love will arrest the disuniting of America. Can I, can I, can I, I say, I say, I, uh, I, and, and uh, he's, wearing a, he's wearing a tape notice, so uh, <laughs> his words are going to be recorded. Uh, that, that's the same as Bob. I was rather hoping you'd all come up with something different, unless you want to disagree. I mean, Danny, I mean, you don't, don't have to agree with him, because if we're going to end up with one achievement, it's not going to be much of a century. Well, I would take what... Um, both Bob and Arthur said, and perhaps relocated, what I see as the great accomplishment of this American century is the influence of social movements, and I would include the labor movement, the women's movement, as well as the civil rights movement. We didn't just happen to open the doors to more black people. People struggled in yes, collective yes. action to realize a dream and to help America live up to her dreams. And I think it's witnessing the ability of people, very ordinary people, to get involved in making a difference in their lives and in the lives of their um, neighbors and the next generation that really has been an enormous achievement. And I include more than just the civil rights movement. I definitely include the women's movement and the labor movement. On the other hand, I see the disintegration of those movements and the surrender of those movements to a form of cosmetic diversity in which we measure the success by the number of people who look like the people who were part of that movement who have now infiltrated positions of um, power within a static hierarchy. So we have a lot more to do. To do. The, pop the popular revolution. Yes. The greatest achievement of the 20th century, American century. You don't have to agree I'm with him. I'm glad that <laughs> no, he doesn't I'm, have to I'm agree with to everything we said. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I, can, if I can come up with something that will generate applause. Oh, no, no. The greatest achievement of America in this century is the containment and, uh, r the, containment and the triumph over the Soviet threat. Mm -hmm. Well... It, Wait, wait a minute. Not a bad thought. We've never been to Gulag. Yes. The great, and that's an American achievement principally, you would yes. say. Yes, yes. Who, 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 who should fact, get... In the, your book, you say very much the same thing. I do, but you don't, you don't have to... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kind of neutral tonight, Governor. The, um, you were going to ask him a question. I well, I was going to ask him who should get the credit for ending the Cold War. <clears throat> Reagan. What about Gorbachev? <laughs> Is that there? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, obviously, <laughs> the the entire the entire country takes uh, takes credit. Some people played major roles. Some people made less less than major roles. I happen to think that Reagan um, was a striking figure, and that uh, his rhetorical isolation of the problem and evil empire had an enormous mobilizing important effect here and abroad. I would suggest, they, Harry, yeah. that Lenin and Stalin deserve right. a lot of credit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But they showed that communism was a political, economic, and moral dis disaster. I'm with Arthur. I would, have, I would have said that the Soviet, uh, the, the people who ran the Soviet Union for all those years and invested so heavily in the military and did nothing for the economy, doomed it to eventual collapse. And I think it might have been accelerated somewhat by President Reagan. But the, the two great achievements, I think, of this century, as far as I'm concerned, were <clears throat> one, the, uh, the William Brennan-led court, which... Uh, Inter William Brennan, Justice Brennan's court, which was the Warren court, <clears throat> but Justice Brennan was the, 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 the moving force, I think, uh, which interpolated into the Constitution readings of, of uh, its language that uh, guaranteed us uh, a whole new range of uh, private and personal rights and liberties in this country. And the other monumental achievement came starting with Teddy Roosevelt, I guess, uh, and it was this acceptance of the principle that things not said in the Constitution ought to be interpolated in, in terms of the obligation we have 
to strengthen the whole by strengthening the weakest parts. Right. And that's what Social Security was, and that's what workers' compensation was. And then some years later, Medicaid and Medicare, 65. Uh, these are new ideas. This is a new version of our democracy, one that is not found in the Constitution. Again, the Constitution does not tell us to love one another or to help one another. That began in this century. Right. And it's a process that I hope is only just beginning. It began with Teddy Roosevelt, perhaps. Right. <laughs> Anita, the greatest achievement. Got to give two. Lana, oh, yeah. mentioned, Lana mentioned mine. I'll have one and a half. All right. The empowerment of women, the, the increasing uh, recognition that women are talented as business people, voters, workers, etc. Second thing is science, technology, and medicine. Americans have been very, very important throughout the world in improving uh, health care, improving uh, 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 physics, mathematics, and so forth. We got to the moon, we got pictures of Mars. We uh, got rid of smallpox in the U.S. We got rid of polio in the U.S. These are marvelous achievements. We're discovering the secrets of the human genome. I You're think on the human genome important. project, aren't you? Well, I was. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I think those kinds of achievements are mm -hmm. uh, barely mentioned th this, this evening. But, I mean, it's, tr it's tremendous. Television, radio, automobiles, computers. We've really uh, advanced technology mm -hmm. uh, in, in important directions. And I think we're just at the beginning of that. That as well. What's the time? <laughs> We're five minutes. Five, five minutes to eight. Five minutes to eight, isn't it? I want to ask one last question before we break up. And some people will say I should have asked it earlier. The trouble is that if I'd asked it earlier, we'd never got round to some of the interesting things we've been discussing. The present situation in Washington. Is it a constitutional crisis of any significance, or will history regard... I had hoped that we would have possible for half a dozen people to have an enlightened and interesting discussion without mentioning the word monica okay. all right all right i wasn't going no i wasn't going to mention it i wasn't going to mention it and in fact i'm quite happy if, if the mood of the audience is we've had enough i want to thank this very distinguished <laughs> panel <laughs> say hello to your husband and uh and 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 I want to thank very much the audience for coming, and I'm sorry that Bill Buckley's friends didn't clap enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut it off. <laughs> I think that was well timed.